Hey, thanks so much for tuning into our YouTube channel. Whether you're new here or whether you visit here frequently, we just want to say thanks so much for tuning in. Would you consider giving us a subscription or a like or a comment? Again, thanks so much for tuning in to Victory City's YouTube channel. Ah, oh, man, it makes you want to have more kids. <laughs> not, <laughs> I got four, yeah, grandchildren. I'm not ready for grandchildren yet. I'm 40, man. I ain't ready to be that old. Even though my hair is losing and I'm gray and all that kind of stuff. All right. Hey, I want to, I know I have a message and I've got, yeah, let me look at the time. Okay. Um, I want to, in all transparency, I want to give you guys a, just kind of a status report on where we are at the church. I'm going to take five minutes. Can I do that? Um, we're entering into a phase where they're going to be uh, doing some demo work in our elementary room. And we're going to be moving all of our elementary. Your little ones are going to be fine. Our elementary students are now going to be starting to meet in two weeks in our offices. So the church staff will no longer have an office. Um, and we're giving up our offices for our elementary kids. Uh, because, and I'm pushing our contractors, and they're, and they're really doing a great job. They really are. Um, to have our kids wing open by the middle of December. And uh, they've got some pictures here. I'd love to just show you the progress we're making um, these are all the walls that have been built. The electricians, HVAC has been out all week. Um, you guys can, that's the outside. We're going to be doing some brick. We're actually going to be painting the whole building white. We're getting away from the khaki. And uh, so these are all our elementary rooms. Doors have gone in. It's just amazing. And your generosity has paved the way for that. Um, we still got more to go, but praise God. That's going to be the hallway. It's really cool. I can't wait till that's filled with children and parents and families. Can you see it in faith in Jesus' name? Praise God. So much fun. Okay. All right. Yeah, I got, I got three minutes. I got three minutes to tell you this. Here's where we're at. You know we're expanding this auditorium to 600 seats just to create more space for more families to come because we want to reach as many people as possible. Here's the deal. You know the 10 o'clock parking is a problem. Um, for the past six months, we've been negotiating with a private equity group who owns this five acres next to us. Um, and they've only wanted to sell all five acres uh, and they wanted $3 million for it. I don't have $3 million. Uh, and so we needed God to make a way. And so we started to pray and pray and pray. And they were, they were really decided we're not going to split it off. And uh, I was like, all I need is an acre and a half because that'll give me 100 more parking spots. They wouldn't sell it, wouldn't sell it. Um, and about a month ago, uh, God worked away. That's the only way I can explain it. They came back to me and they said, hey, we'd be willing to sell an acre and a half. Praise God. They go. Yeah, yeah. M miracle one. <laughs> um, I said, great. He goes, but because we're going to sell it off, we got to sell it at a premium. I go, okay. Um, they told us that it would cost $800,000 for an acre and a half. Well, uh, with our board and our lawyers, uh, we drew up paperwork and we sent an offer Friday and we offered $520,000. So it's a little bit less than $800,000. Um, and here's where we are financially. Um, when we went early to build the building, I went a year early and it was a good thing because God's blessed our church. Our church has grown, awesome stuff. And I couldn't imagine beginning construction now because we'd have nowhere to put people. Um, we went for it. And we, when we went for it, we had about $100,000 left in the bank. We now have built that cash reserve up to $600,000. Um, so we have enough barely to pay for it. Um, and I still have construction to do, all those types of things. And so here's, here's where we're at. We've taken a step of faith, um, and we don't have the cash for it. You guys, you guys hear what I'm saying? Uh, we don't have the cash for it. Now, every year in December, I only take one... If you know me, I take one offering a Sunday. I don't do a bunch of special offerings. I don't do three, you know, some churches, they do three offerings a Sunday. We don't do that. Uh, I take one offering a week. And then once a year, I do an above and beyond offering. Um, and I'm just letting you know so you can start to pray and believe with me. Um, we're going to need to probably raise $600,000 to pay for that parking. Now, here's the thing. Parking's not inspiring. It's not fun. You know, like pay for new kids space. Yeah, let's reach the kids, you know. Um, you know, build a, build a church in the Philippines, which we are. We're, I mean, we're, we're, we're funding missions work every month. We're doing stuff like that. We've not stopped that. But um, here's what I just need. I need us as a church to believe for a miracle that we, 
uh, obedient to the Lord, man, we can see God do it. And I pray they accept the offer. I will always lead with transparency. There's no shady stuff behind closed doors. Um, and uh, that's kind of where we're at. So I need you to pray with me, believe with me. And then guess what? When it's come time, I'll tell you the price. Here's what we've agreed on. And then church, we're going to have to raise it. We're going to have to believe in it. And uh, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. But it is going to take a step of faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's all of us together, sacrificially giving. And I believe, man, we're going to have 100 new parking spots, which means this. When you invite your friends, they don't show up and they're nowhere to park. And, you know, thank you for all the trucks that can hop the curb and park on the grass. I appreciate you. Uh, thank you, oh, America. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> we're... Uh, we're going we're gonna to take a step of faith. Amen? Sound good? All right, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 4. Thank you, Ivy. You did so good. Matthew chapter 4 is going to be our text this morning. And I'm going to be efficient in my communication today um, as we continue this series called Clickbait, which is all about temptation and when the enemy gets you to click uh, and then installs a virus on your computer. I want to start with a question and... And you can answer this to yourself or with those you're with. The question is this. If you know, if you knew the exact moment in your week when the enemy was going to tempt you, how would you prepare for that? So if you knew that Thursday at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, you're going to get an email that's going to trigger you, and that would be an opportunity for the enemy to tempt you, uh, where you would normally... Man, close your laptop, go to the liquor store and go, man, forget about that. Or you knew that today at 3 p.m. you were going to be tempted. How would you prepare? Would you pray a little bit more? Would you maybe read your scripture a little bit more? Uh, Would you tell somebody about it and be like, hey, listen, this Thursday at 3 p.m. I'm going to be really tempted and I want to stand tall. I want to be strong. I don't want to fall to that. So would you be praying for me? Uh, But here's what I would say, that if you knew you were going to be tempted this week, this Thursday, at 3 p.m. on a Thursday, you would not do nothing. You would prepare yourself for the fight that you knew was coming. Can I tell you that in the battle of temptation, it's not just about knowing what tempts you. It's about also knowing when you are most vulnerable to temptation. They're going to throw that on the screen. I want to say it again for all of you. The battle of temptation, to understand temptation, right here, they're going to put it up. To understand temptation, we must not only understand what, all of us have an individual what, we all have a unique what that tempts us. We must, it's not just the what, but it's also when I am most vulnerable to temptation. As we begin to study Matthew chapter four, it's important to understand the context. Now, Matthew chapter four is the story when Jesus is tempted. Matthew chapter three is his big moment where he's baptized. This is a really pivotal moment in the life of Jesus. And you can see in scripture, in Matthew chapter three, verse 16, it says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. Verse 17 says this, And behold, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So this is a really pivotal moment in Jesus' life. You see the Trinity for my theologians come in all at once. You see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You see the affirmation that God is giving to Jesus. Hey, you're my son. This is a really, really incredible moment. It's a mountaintop moment. Uh, We had baptisms last Sunday, and for a lot of individuals who were baptized, that was a really mountaintop moment, and it should be. And as a church, we should celebrate that, and we should stand with people and, and really cheer them on as they take steps closer to Jesus. Now, you may not have gotten baptized, but there are moments where you take spiritual steps of growth. And it feels like, yes, I'm doing it. I'm taking a step. Maybe you showed up to church today and you're like, big step. Maybe you read your Bible this week, big step. Maybe you shared your faith this week, big step. Maybe you did something to serve another person, big step. And and there's moments in your walk with Jesus that are big faith steps. And that's important and you should celebrate that. But here's what we have to understand from the scriptural context is that Jesus goes from a mountaintop moment into a wilderness situation. 
Now, Matthew chapter four, let's read the first opening passages. It says this, then Jesus was led up by the spirit. So this is right after his baptism, led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. This gives us a picture that Jesus was human as well as divine. He's hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I want to title today's message, Timing Temptation. Timing Temptation. You see, there are moments where you will have big mountaintop moments and it almost feels like right after a mountaintop moment, that's when the enemy comes in to try to steal that. That's when the enemy tries to come in and rob you of that. That's when the enemy tries to come in and tempt you right after a really big pivotal moment in your life. I can remember uh, as a kid, we'd come home from school and we would always play football in the front yards of our neighborhood because all the yards were connected and uh, we didn't have these little short yards like some of the neighborhoods do now where you've got like basically five feet to the sidewalk. We had big front yards and we would play in multiple yards and the only problem about playing football in front yards is that there was this really strong safety called an oak tree. (laughs) And every once in a while, you know, you're going for the Hail Mary and you're running and you're looking at the ball over your shoulder, right? And you don't know what's in front of you and all of a sudden you catch it and you run square into one of those trees. Sometimes life can feel that way. It feels like you're about to score. It feels like you've just beat the defense. It's just like there's, oh my goodness, this is gonna be amazing. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you hit something really hard. You hit temptation. You bump into something that's rather difficult. And this is something that I see in my own life. I see in the lives of people. The honeymoon often gets cut short. I just came to Christ. I just started taking a step. I just got baptized. I just started taking my walk with Jesus seriously. I just began to trust God with my finances. And just when we think we're good, it's like the enemy comes in right at that moment. Here's something I want you to consider and think about. When God is actively working in our life, we must be aware that so is our enemy. Let me say that again, just so you can understand that. When God is actively working in our life, we must be aware that so is our enemy. We must develop temptation awareness. We know it's going to come. And if I know it's coming, I can be prepared. The problem is, is temptation never comes at you when you want it to come at you. It always comes at you when you're least prepared. My first thought for you today, if you're a note taker, is this, is temptation often comes when we are physically weak. Matthew chapter four, verse one says that then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. So Jesus is physically weak, but spiritually strong. The devil is tempting Jesus. Jesus, do a little door dash. If you're really strong and mighty, snap your fingers and turn this rock into fresh sourdough. Okay, what does this mean for you and I? There are going to be moments, let's just take marriage. There's going to be moments in your marriage where you don't feel as connected to your spouse. And maybe you're tired because it's a difficult season. There's been a lot of friction, a lot of frustration, a lot of difficult conversations, and it's just not working like it did maybe a few months ago or a few years ago. And you're tired you're exhausted, and you're emotionally looking for intimacy, but because your marriage is on the rocks, you've not had that, meaning you have been, you've been missing that in your soul. And then all of a sudden, someone walks in that is not your spouse, and it promises to feed that part of you, and you think it's drama-free, it's okay, it'll just be one time. Temptation never comes when the marriage is great. Temptation temptation never comes when you've gotten lucky four times that week. Temptation always comes when it's been three months. 
You know what I'm talking about? It's in that opportune time. Temptation knows when to come at you. Other moments, it could be I've not been noticed. No one's given me accolades. No one's seen the good things I'm doing. No one's recognized me. No one's shared a kind word for me. And because of that, in our soul, we're looking for affirmation. And because we're not getting it from other people when we want it, all of a sudden the devil knows exactly when to tempt you. And in that moment of weakness, he lays down an offense. And then we get offended. And we hold that offense. No one loves me. No one recognizes. My husband never sees the things I do. My, my wife doesn't see what I do. My kids don't understand. Pastor doesn't understand. My friends don't understand. And then we get offended because the enemy knows exactly when to do it. Maybe you've been working hard. You've been slaving at work. Complications, troubles, financial situations, family situations, and the stress keeps building and building and building, and you are so stressed out because so many things are happening, and you're just getting overwhelmed, and you don't have any peace, and, and then someone does something rather innocently. It's like the straw that broke the camel's back because it's been building and building and building, and then all of a sudden, the enemy can use something that someone did to you and you just go off. You give them both barrels. You lose control. You lose control of your anger. And we justify it. But the enemy knows when, when to get us. This is exactly why Jesus is tempted in this moment. Is Jesus hungry? Of course he's hungry. He's fasted for 40 days. If I don't eat for four hours, I'm hungry. Can Jesus turn stone into bread? Yes, he can. But he doesn't allow himself to be tempted. What does Jesus do? Jesus understands this. He says in verse four, he says, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus goes above the problem. He says, if meeting a physical need damages me spiritually, I won't do it. If meeting an immediate need damages me in the long run, I won't do it. If the affair appeases me in the moment but ruins my marriage, I won't do it. If getting angry in the moment appeases me in the moment but it destroys my children, destroys my spouse, hurts my friendships, I won't do it. And Jesus answers the temptation with scripture, meaning that he has this, he has a spiritual perspective on a natural temptation. It's pretty interesting. My question for you is what scriptures do you use to fight temptation that you face? Jesus isn't quoting a new scripture here. He's not making something up in the moment. He's actually quoting a verse from Deuteronomy. So what scriptures do you use in moments where you are tempted? I have a statement for you, and I think a lot of people make this mistake, and here's what they do. They try to use willpower in the moment. Can I just tell you, church, that willpower cannot defeat hell power? Because the enemy never tempts you when your willpower is strong. And I know some of you, You've built great businesses, you've got great homes, you, you, um, you have great families, you're, you're, you're physically fit, you're disciplined in so many areas of your life, you have a lot of willpower. But how many of you guys know that willpower slowly diminishes over time? Even look at the day, you can have really strong willpower in the morning, but it goes down in the evening. The enemy knows the level of your willpower and will send the temptation when your willpower is at its lowest. So you have to have something else you rely on besides your own discipline and besides your own willpower. Some of you, you're trying to defeat temptation by just going, I'll do better next time. And you are caught in a vicious cycle of you do good for a few months because your willpower is high, but then the willpower starts to drop and that's when the enemy gets you. So what scriptures do you use to fight off temptation, right? Scripture is described as a double-edged sword, meaning there is not a defensive side to that sword. Some swords are one-sided. 
There's a cutting side and a blocking side. The scripture describes the Bible and scriptures as an all attack weapon. It's like the University of Texas with Archie Manning. It's all attack, baby. Hook him. Let's go. We're going forward the whole time. But some of us, we do not even have the sword to be able to fight temptation. How many of you guys, you want me to give you some scriptures for temptation? I'm kidding. Read your Bible. Find them yourself. <laughs> I'm having fun. No, use Google. Use Google. It's great. Second thought I have for you today is this, and we're going to go deeper. Each one, we're going to go a little deeper. The second ramification of Jesus' temptation here is that this, is temptation will always attack your identity in Christ. Let's look at scripture. It says this, and the tempter came to him and said, look what it says, if you are the son of God, hold up. The chapter before the heavens opened up, a dove came down, God publicly says, you are my son in whom I am well pleased, and the enemy immediately is attacking his identity. If you are. Do you ever fall into temptation and then you begin to wonder, am I really saved? Does God really love me? Does this temptation or does this Christianity thing actually work? Do you begin to doubt moments of your own salvation and your own standing with God after you've fallen? I can remember as a young man, immature in my faith. I would give my heart to Christ on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night for a youth event, and I would mean it with every fiber in my body. I wanted to follow Jesus, but because I was human, I would do something dumb, I'd sin, and I thought at that moment, oh my gosh, God's mad at me. He doesn't love me anymore. I'm no longer a Christian. I'm now going to hell. And I'd go back to church the following Sunday, and guess what I would do? I would give my heart to Jesus again. I think I probably got saved 97 times. <laughs> this is an immature understanding of following Jesus. It paints a picture that God is constantly mad at you. The truth is, that Jesus loves me and God loves me and he's there for me. But the enemy here is trying to attack Jesus' position with God. Temptation is designed to separate you from your creator. It's designed to give you doubts about your position in Christ. It's designed to make you unsure of whether you're in good standing with God. And look what Paul writes in Romans chapter 520 as a counter effect to this feeling. It says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Have you ever had seasons where sin is increasing in your life? Anybody? Right? And you begin to feel condemned. Come on, have you ever sat next to your spouse and you feel like, you know what? Anytime the pastor talks about something, my spouse just elbows me going, sin is increasing. You know, I touch your neighbor, tell him sin's increasing. And now you can tell, tell them back, but grace abounds that much more. Husbands, when your wife elbows you, just tell them grace abounds that much more. So here's what I want to tell you this morning. God knows you're not perfect. God knows you're going to make mistakes. God knows you're going to fail. And yes, there'll be seasons where sin is increasing, but grace abounds all that much more. His forgiveness abounds, his mercy abounds, his love abounds, and I know this to be true now that I'm a father. My kids are not perfect. They do some stupid things. Do I kick them out of my house? No. Do I take my name from them? You're no longer Winston Morris. You're John Doe. <laughs> when my kids make a mistake, do they need correction and consequence? Yes, they do. And I apply that. But more than anything, they need to know that I love them. In fact, before I even give consequence or even give correction, the first thing I do is I say, son, I love you. And that was a poor decision. But I love you. And now we have to get to the not fun part. No more Fortnite. 
for a month, you would think I'd like shot him. And he's like, oh my God. <laughs> but I love my kids. Can I tell you that God is a good father? And the enemy is trying to get you to believe the lie of if you are. I want you to remember these three statements. If you want to write them down, you can. In fact, I would love for you to rehearse these and say these over your life every single day this week. And it's this right here. I am loved by God. Thank you, Jim. Let's try it again. I am loved by God. I am saved by his grace. And God is quick to forgive. Okay, just me so you can write it down. I am loved by God. I am saved by grace. And God is quick to forgive. God will not remove the consequences of our actions because those are there to teach us. But he will also never remove his love from you. He will never reject you as sons and daughters of Christ. Temptation attacks our identity. And it knows when to attack it. God does not expect you to have willpower over hell power. He expects you to use his word and his strength. The enemy knows if you've had a mountaintop moment that the attacks are going to come. In fact, I tell when people give their heart to Christ, have big spiritual moments, I tell them, buckle up. The next month's going to get real. You see this in the scripture, the parable of the sower. The farmer casts out seed. Some seed lands on good soil and begins to produce fruit. Other seed lands on the path. And what happens? The birds come and eat away the seed. This is a picture <clears throat> of what the enemy does in our life. Okay, third thing. And I'm going to close right here. And we're going to go real deep here. I need you to see this. This has all been surface level stuff. Here's the real root of temptation. Temptation gets me and keeps me focused on me. Temptation is all about me. Think about it. We're going to go deeper level. I'm going to show you. So lean in with me. This is beyond surface level. Jesus was hungry. The devil was tempting him to prove you really are the son of God. Do we know that Jesus had the power to do this? Of course we do. In fact, we see him later in the gospels take five loaves and two fishes and feed 10,000 people, over 10,000 people. And look what it says in scripture. I'm gonna bring that same scripture back up. If you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. What is the deeper temptation? What's beyond the hunger? What's beyond the immediate? The enemy is trying to provoke Jesus to use his power and ability to serve himself. Okay, I want you to lean in. In our eyes, would this be completely justifiable? Of course it would. He's hungry. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. Who does it hurt? The problem is, is that Jesus had a purpose and a mission, and he was not going to be deviated from it. In fact, Jesus tells you what his mission on earth is in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. They're going to throw it on the screen. It says this, even as the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus' purpose was to serve, not be served. At the root of all temptation is ultimately a way to serve ourselves. When we get angry and we let people have it, who's it serving? Me. When I look at pornographic images that I know are chemically proven to be toxic for our soul, who are we indulging? Me. When I'm greedy with my money, who are we indulging? Me. When I use substances to find peace, who are we indulging? Me. Even when we gossip and we talk about other people, who are we really serving? Me. 
It's a way of appeasing our selfish nature rather than seeing our higher purpose. You see, every single person in Christ has a purpose and a calling. Every person. I'm going to talk about this more next week, but, but our purpose and calling is something that the enemy wants to keep you from fulfilling. Maybe you're new to Christ. You don't know your purpose. You don't know your calling. Give God a year. He'll show you. But God has created you with design and meaning. God has a calling beyond the reality of your life. God has a calling beyond your career. God has a calling beyond your accomplishments. God has a purpose for your life. And temptation's toxicity is it lends, it, 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 it lures us into a mindset of what is in it for me. Here, Jesus could have easily said, yes, I'm going to use my power to just serve me for a minute. I'm hungry. I want to eat. And there's moments in your life where you're going to want something. You're going to want it. And you're going to say this, who's it hurting anyways? What's the problem? It's just this one time. I'll give into it. But the problem is, is then you slowly develop a pattern in your life that you'll make comp compromises, you'll fudge the lines, you'll move the boundaries. Because if you want something bad enough, you're willing to compromise to get it. Jesus doesn't do this. And I have a question for you. Simple question, not hard. And that's this, am I using all that I have for only what I want? Am I using all I have for only what I want? Am I using all my time for me? Am I using all my money for me? Am I using all my energy for me? All my focus? Some of you are incredible, incredible entrepreneurs. Some of you are incredible engineers. Some of you are incredible business people. Some of you are incredible teachers. Some of you have such great gifting. Some of you, you've never met a stranger. You, you, I can throw you in a crowd and by the end of that day, you will know everybody's life story because you're that gregarious. Some of you, you can walk into a room and you can see details with excellence and you can go, let's fix this, let's tweak this. Some of you have incredible ability. You have incredible gifts. The problem is, is that you're using those gifts just for you. You may say, well, Eric, listen, I take my kids to sports and I take them all over the place. Yes, but is it really still for you? I'm at ball fields every weekend. And I see parents vicariously living through their children. They want their kid to be the athlete. Not really for the kid, but for themselves. Is all my money going to my lifestyle? And I don't want that curbed. When I get home late after using all my energy at work and I have nothing left for my family, what if one of the best ways to overcoming temptation is to lean into your higher calling and higher purpose, not just our selfish indulgences. Here Jesus does this. In fact, nowhere in Scripture, not even one time, do you see Jesus use his divine power for himself. He's hanging on the cross and they're tempting him and jeering him and mocking him and they say, call down the angels of heaven, Jesus, to save you. Could Jesus do it? Of course he could. He was fully divine. But he didn't. Because he understood that what he had wasn't just for him. Now you may say, Eric, come on, it's Jesus, bro. I get it. I get it. But as followers of Jesus, our goal in life should over time begin to look more and more like him. And our world needs more people that look like Jesus. Your home needs a father that looks like Jesus. 
your home needs a mother that looks like Jesus. Every afternoon, you don't have to be overwhelmed and overstimulated. Fathers, you don't have to be drained from work every day you come home, exhausted. Families, you don't have to organize your life just around what you want. And this is the root of this temptation. Jesus, will you use your power to serve yourself? Or will you use your power to serve humanity? So I don't know what your week looks like. I don't know in what space that this message is hitting you. Maybe it's not at all. But I believe that when the people of God begin to ask themselves, what do I have that can help the world be a better place? What do I have that I could put in the hands of Jesus and him use? And in so doing, we all take a step closer to Jesus. And when we take a step closer to Jesus, we look more like Jesus. Amen? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you, you, you know the uniqueness of every person's story here today. And God, I pray that you would take these simple words that lack eloquence. And God, I pray that you would take these simple words that truthfully the principles come from you. God, I pray you would use them in every individual person's life. God, I pray you would use it uniquely in their soul, in their life. And God, I pray that God, if it's knowing how to time temptation knowing when I'm physically weak, an attack is coming. God, if it's getting a picture of a higher calling and a higher purpose in their life and not just being self-indulgent, and God, I pray that we're able, God, to listen to your wisdom and your voice, God, in overcoming the enemy's attack on our life. And God, the best defense is a real good offense. And God, we will move forward as a church. God, I pray over the 10 o'clock today that, God, every person here, God, would at least just take one step forward today. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, church. Everybody said together? Amen. Hey, I love you, church. Isaac and Haley are going to give some next steps. Amen. Hey, if you made it this far, hopefully the message encouraged you. Hopefully it built your faith. And we'd love to hear about it. We'd love to hear your testimony and your story. Would you consider sending us an email and letting us know how God is moving in your life. You can email us at info at victorycity.church. Also, this is able to happen because of so many people who financially support Victory City Church. If God is leading you to do that, please consider going to victorycity.church forward slash give and any financial contribution that you make would definitely help us uh, continue in our mission to help every person take a step closer to Jesus. And finally, last thing, and then you can turn off, is this. We don't view these things as the church. We view it as a supplement to regular local church attendance. If you need help finding uh, a local church to be a part of, email us at info at victorycity.church, and we would love to help you.